Hi, I'm Lynn Green. Welcome to Art of the Matter, Sculptor's Edition. Follow along as I visit local Penticton sculptors and find out what inspires them. It's so exciting to have public art in our community of Penticton. Kendry Grove. I'm Lynn Green and we're in her wonderful studio on the top of the mountain with pine trees blowing and it's a fabulous day. So you've been an artist a long time. Yeah I've been um, I've been essentially a professional artist for about 30 years. Wow. So I started right right out of high school basically and uh, and was and was um, working and selling some of my work while I was going through art school to help me put my way through art school. And then uh, when I graduated from, I went to the Alberta College of Art and Design in Calgary, which is now the Alberta University of the Arts. And um, yeah, I started, started a studio practice, professional studio practice as soon as I, as soon as I was finished. Did you always know this is what you wanted all the time? Pretty much. Up? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I was, I was drawing as early as I can remember. And everyone said to you, oh, you're an artist? Was it like that? Well, yeah, you, you, you get people noticing. I had a, a certain amount of um, um, just just innate talent, uh, the ability to see and translate and, and copy basically what I saw uh, onto the page. And from there I started to paint and explore explore some of the wildlife subjects that I loved so much. And, um, and then about 15 years ago, I sort of space opened up in the studio uh, in my practice where I just was ready to start sculpting. I, I kind of knew I was going to sculpt at some point. I really wanted to, but I wasn't, wasn't ready. And I didn't necessarily know how, how I wanted to, to do it. But I met a lot of sculptors and, and um, they were so generous with their knowledge and their time um, and their encouragement to say, yeah, go for it, just, just go for it. And actually, one of my biggest teachers, as far as sculpture is concerned, was actually the foundry that I started working with out of Kelowna. They're called Pyramid Bronze Works, and they they were great because I could bring them a sculpture and say, "Okay, can you cast this?" <laughs> and they would, you know, they would be able to to um, give me a, an idea of of what things to watch for. And and I mean, they can work some amazing magic. Uh, but it gave me a, a, a deeper insight into how to balance things and and uh, what the costs were in terms of how how I plan my work so it was good. Were there specific things about the techniques that you had to change or uh, broaden or 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 something in the in what they say? Mainly mainly it was um, the balancing like like the sculptures when they're when they're in clay form like this are they're solid they've got um, They've got armature, uh, mm -hmm. armature wire and architecture and stuff underneath, and then you build up on top. Um, and sometimes you build up with other objects, like some of the bigger the bigger pieces have spray foam insulation built up inside or paper wrapped really densely, so that the the because the clay itself is very heavy. So so w the way I balance a, a sculpture for with the clay is quite different than than because the bronze is so is so dense and strong the alloy that a piece can pivot off of like the back end tail and leg and stuff like that and 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 the center as long as it's bolted down to to uh, a stone base or something like that it can extend way way out it doesn't need any support mm -hmm. um whereas of course the clay does it has to have everything holding it up because the clay is soft and it'll just lock, it'll all just collapse so um yeah certain certain aspects of of how you plan 
how you plan a piece and, and what you what you um, what you use for armature and how solid it is. And uh, some pieces have to be cut off when they mold, when they do the mold. Um, and then it all gets reassembled in the wax version. And then the final mold is the is the ceramic mold that, that is what the bronze gets poured into once they've burned the wax out of it. So I can mm -hmm. I can take you through the process if you'd like or well that or we would can be just talk fascinating. About it. Okay, so um, essentially it's it's um, two molds and a wax in between. The wax is a positive version of my sculpture and it has to be uh, it has to be hollow inside because the final bronze is hollow. If the bronze were solid, it wouldn't actually cast. It would it would um, I mean it would cast, but it would do wonky strange things because of the temperature differential between the molten liquid and liquid metal inside and then the surface as the surface cools you'd get pitting and you'd get um, uh, distortions and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So the final bronze is usually about a quarter of an inch or uh, an eighth of an inch thick, a quarter of an inch, some, somewhere in there and it's um, <clears throat> it's made out of a really hard wax that gets run through the first primary mold which is made of rubber silicon and it captures even my fingerprints will, will oh, be captured wow. in so the same thing that the dentist uses when they take an impression of your teeth is what is what's used to capture the detail on the on the sculpture and then um, and then when they take the mold off um, the clay comes back to me and it gets it gets kind of mangled I've got some pieces <laughs> so I've got a box down there that has has old parts and bits of sculptures that come back and I dismantle them and I reuse all the all the clay um, so then they put the mold back together again, the wax gets run through it, and then the wax has to be chased and cleaned up, and pits and uh, things like that have to have to be um, removed. Um, and then, and any seam lines and stuff, and then the wax itself, they, it all gets assembled and put back together again in a way that's going to work for the for the pouring. And then they, uh, they do a, a, a ceramic slurry a ceramic mold, which is like a shell mold that goes over top of, of the wax and it coats inside the wax as well as outside of the wax so that when, when, the, when the mold gets fired at the end, all the wax melts out of that, out of that mold and they, they reuse it, which is where the term lost wax comes from. Mm -hmm. And then the bronze is immediately poured into the, while the mold is still hot, it's poured into that ceramic shell into the cavity that was left by the wax when the wax left when the wax mm -hmm. burned out and then um, once it cools they have to chip off the shell to get the bronze out so the the uh, the wax gets destroyed for each casting and so does the second ceramic shell and then they have to go back to the original rubber silicon mold in order to do another piece in the addition wow what a process eh? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. here's a wax so you can see this guy hasn't been chased yet. He's he's um, still got bubbles and excess excess wax that needs to be needs mm -hmm. to be cleaned out. Mm -hmm. And you can see the seam line there where the mold was pulled apart. Mm -hmm. But um, the main thing is that he's hollow inside, and so the the final bronze ends up being about that about that thick. The only pieces I think of mine that are actually solid are really small. So those little those little tiny elephants mm -hmm. over here. These little guys are solid bronze. I did a set of four little elephants oh. like this. What is it about horses? Were you raised with horses? I was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was raised with uh, Morgan horses. My parents uh, had, a, had a horse farm. Mm -hmm. And they were also working crazily uh, full-time jobs as well in, in uh, Calgary. Mm -hmm. But uh, they had a... They had a 40-acre uh, um, farm and um, and a herd of horses, and so so my earliest memories are, you know, getting woken up in the middle of the night to go into the barn to 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 see a foal being born or wow. playing in the haystacks or, or the you know um, all the farm cats and and um, yeah yeah so so I've been around horses my whole life so I know them very intimately and very well and. Um, um, I didn't actually start, interestingly enough, I didn't actually start painting horses or working with them as a subject matter until I no longer actually had a horse physically. And when I, and when I no longer had a horse, um, <clears throat> that's when I started to paint and, and sculpt them. So it was like the relationship shifted um, onto a different level.
kind of like your longing for that childhood uh, experience of horses drew you into creating them to kind of fill that yeah I that suppose spot. I suppose that would be one way of looking at it yeah. I think um, ultimately it's it was uh, it was like like finding a way to connect with them on a deeper level that was mm. that was not not didn't have anything to do with the physical world writing your your fantasy writing where did that fall in <clears throat> okay so I started working on um, on the first book about um, 16 years ago and it essentially was um, a scene that arrived and I was falling asleep every night and it happened like three or four three or four days in a row where I would be falling asleep and these characters were um, they were there and they were interacting and and it was just the same scene I kept seeing it over and over again and um, and I thought okay well maybe if I write it down it'll it'll go away <laughs> and, and ultimately what happened was was the act of sitting down and actually writing that scene out um, opened a opened a door it opened a floodgate and and the rest wow. of the story started to pour through and <clears throat> honestly I it was <clears throat> it was so great my my husband he was like don't worry about it just just write because because I, it took me away from my studio practice and other things that you know I was like I, I I can't I I need to write this but how do I how do I balance that with my studio work and so anyway I, I ended up taking off the entire the entire sort of summer six months and and just wrote and this this book came out um, literally like I was reading it as as it was being written it was amazing uh, mm. uh, an experience of I've I've heard songwriters talk about this or poets where where they're 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 the po the po as the poem comes in if they don't write fast enough they'll lose it they'll miss it yeah right and it, mm -hmm. it was very much a, a similar process um, so the 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 book was written and then um, and I spent twelve years trying to figure out what to do with it <laughs> so I had right. I had the bones of it I had the the basic story and I was a good storyteller but I wasn't necessarily a writer and so I needed so I needed to find somebody who could help me edit it and uh, and and make it a good well-written story so um, so I was able to find a fantastic editor her name's Dawn Renaud she lives here locally mm -hmm. and um, she taught me a ton about actually writing as well mm -hmm. so so by the by the time we got through the the first book um, I got to the end and then and then as I was as I was going back to reread it was like oh no <laughs> I have to re I have to rewrite this. <laughs> so so I probably did about four passes or five passes, rewriting, 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 because every time I got to the end, I had I would have learned, you know, I had learned so much I needed to go back and apply it. And um, and so with with the publishing of that, so I self published them on Amazon and with the publishing of the first book, uh, within about six months of, of being ready to publish, the artwork started to flow out. And I wasn't necessarily planning on doing illustrations or drawings or sculptures or paintings or anything like that. Um, in fact, I was actively looking for an artist to do the cover for me because I hadn't planned on doing it myself. And, um, and that just went out the window because all this artwork started to pour out. Mm -hmm. And uh, during the, the writing of the second book, actually a lot of the cross-pollination between the artwork uh, production and the stories and the, and the and the actual writing process was was uh, it was really interesting. I would I would have paintings come through and I and I'd be painting them, working on them, and realizing, oh my God, that's a that's this that's a scene. So then I would take the 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 imagery of the painting and I'd go and I'd and I'd write it. So the process for for the second book was was quite quite a bit different. It was more mm -hmm. bouncing around all over the place, um, but just sort of following the, the creative process of, of the artwork and the, and the writing process itself. Um, and then as I got, so the second book got published and as I got into the third book, um, there was a lot, uh, a lot more, a little bit more planning sort of coming into it. So uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm halfway through the third book and um, I would love at some point to do uh, an illustrated version of the books. I'd probably have to break them up into, because they're quite big books, so I'd have to break them up into two, two, two volumes for each of the, of the four. There'll be four when I'm finished, but yeah, the, the, the project itself has really, really just sort of um, snowballed. It's just gotten bigger and bigger and bigger.
and more, more yeah. taking up more and more of my, not only my, my writing time, obviously, but the studio production as well. Although I'm still doing wildlife and, and horses and the other subjects that I'm more well known for, for sure. So where can people find your books? They can find my books on Amazon uh -huh. and I have a, I have a website, the um, stoneguardians.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are links for all the books and, and part of, because I'm doing so much um, uh, visual work, uh, creative visual creative work surrounding the books I decided to do um, a series of companion sketchbooks that go with each so each novel has its own companion sketchbook which which has some of the concept drawings and ideas and the world creation the maps and the and the, the paintings mm. and, and um, some of the more formal illustrations some artist notes and author notes about the project and so they're they're a, a slim volume, but they're really fun. They're really visual, and and they're a lot of fun to create. I discovered that I really actually loved publishing. Um, here's book one, and I've recently redone the cover to be all uh, full full image. Uh, the the beauty of self publishing um, is that you can do multiple iterations of each book. So. <laughs> So you can do different covers or you can you can go in and add, you change, like you can add up illustrations and stuff like that. You can change what you've got um, in different places if you if you want to. So so basically each book has its own uh, companion sketchbook, which which um, explores some of the original drawings and sketches, um, some of the original concept ideas, as well as some of the full the full illustrations for the pieces. And so there's one for each each book. The second book ended up being even longer than the first book, <laughs> but uh, the process of creating the 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 companion sketchbooks uh, is actually a really it's really fulfilling because I can I can um, layer in a lot of the process, especially the cross disciplinary process that I go through to to create the books. If I'm inspired to work on something, I work on it, and it doesn't matter if it's if if it's a painting, a drawing, a sculpture, mm -hmm. or or the writing, or working on the website, or or the online sales stuff that I do. Um, if I'm inspired to to work on it, I work on it, and and I don't necessarily worry about whether or not um, whether or not I should be, or or the fact that I left something else unfinished and I need to <laughs> get back to it. Because ultimately, what happens is is when the work is ready to be finished, it it comes back, and it and it and it the inspiration mm. to to work back into it again is 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 there, and um, and that's very very core, very central to my process as a as an artist. Um, essentially, my my job is to get out of the way as much as possible so that the so that the 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 spirit of of what I'm working on um, can come through with as much clarity and truth as as possible and by by getting out of the way I, I mean essentially not trying to control the process not trying to direct it in any any specific any specific way I think it uh, it gives you more um, c confidence thinking that way and also less stress and well, yeah certainly it, certainly because you you're not the only one producing this there's yeah, something it's, beyond it's us. very much like a like a co-creative process mm -hmm. where where I'm I'm um, my skills are being used and my hands and my body and everything but I'm but I'm sort of the messenger in a way right right to bring mm -hmm. bring forward what what it is that I'm that I'm working on Totally understand. Yeah, it took a while to to <laughs> master that, right? To yeah. to be able to get to the point where, because because ultimately the the work that is the most, um, the clearest, I guess we could call it that, um, also also comes through um, the most effortlessly, hmm. with with the littlest amount of effort, hmm. um, and it it took a while because it, it would happen. Earlier on in my career, it would happen hit and miss. Every once in a while, this would happen, and you're like, "Oh, that was amazing! <laughs> that was an amazing process." And then you go and you try to replicate it, and that that never that never works because then you're ultimately trying to control the process. And and so, the the act of of um, surrendering to the creative flow and letting that lead the way, um, it it took some practice, 
And I think it does for everybody, no matter what mm-hmm. they're doing. When you get to a certain level of, of skill with, mm-hmm. with, with your craft, um, eventually the skill upholds, upholds and, and it, goes into the, it goes into the background. It disappears from your conscious, uh, conscious mind and becomes sort of the, the, um, the structure, the support structure that the creativity can flow through. Um, so you don't have to, because you don't have to think about, well, how do I make that stroke, or how do I mix that color, or how do I, you know, how do I play that note? How do I like any any kind of, um, I think any kind of creative creative work. Ultimately, that's that's one of the goals is to get to a place where you've mastered the skills enough that they can they can shift into the background, and you can you can allow the the actual creative process to guide mm-hmm. guide you wherever it's wherever it's gonna take you, which is, you know exciting yeah. it's a surprise sometimes I'm totally surprised I'm not expecting you know I, I sometimes have a very clear visual of, of what something's going to be as it's coming through and then as I'm working on it, it's like oh that's not at all what I saw but but I couldn't have actually some pieces some sculptures I've I've I couldn't have actually planned the tilt of a head or the or the 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 way the way it ended up coming through I couldn't have actually planned it because I it, it wouldn't have been as good yeah. It might have been stiffer. Or yeah, or contrived, or contrived. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, so the painting came first. I did the painting about uh, three year, three years ago, maybe four years ago. I'm not sure. Um, and it's essentially a scene. This is uh, Torin and his black warhorse, who's a character in the book as well. So that's a big thing about being a. a an equestrian person or somebody who who knows horses is is how diverse their personalities can be and so the horses in uh, the horses in the books are are characters as well <laughs> um, but ultimately this is one of those pieces where I did the painting first and hadn't planned on doing a sculpture of it um, and uh, as I was as I was working on other project I kept seeing it as a as a sculpture and so I began the work um, a few months ago now, I guess, on this one, started started building it up before Christmas, like last fall. So you can see the 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 um, the man is still just in the formative stage, and he's on a separate armature stand. So he'll have to he'll have to get scaled down a little bit, I think, in order to match the horse. So I might have to shorten him a bit. But yeah, starting to put the details in for for the pair of them. Okay. Okay, so this is this is called Spirit Warrior Between the Two Worlds, and uh, when when I first uh, started working on this sculpture, it came fairly quickly on the heels of the painting, which which was uh, about a twenty minute study of um, the concept or the or the the energy behind the piece. Um, and when I was working on it, I had the impression of her walking, either the the horse, either walking through the water or um, transitioning between two different worlds, two different realms. So, so the, the flow of the, the barding and the tail and stuff like that. And also the sort of the, the feeling and the demeanor of, of the warrior, the rider, the horse is incredibly responsive um, in, its, in, its, um, in its attention to its rider. And um, for her, she's, she's, it's like she's coming back from battle. She's finished. Right, and she's she's just in that place of of um, quiet, and um, she's re- she's relaxed. Um, but there's a certain amount of sadness, heaviness, maybe, to her. But the sculpting of this piece was was uh, incredibly powerful for me as a as an artist, mm. and and I uh, literally could I, I don't know this is strange to say but I could literally feel it in my body the day that she got into metal when when she was cast, I could I could I could feel the energy in my body solidify or become grounded or whatever whatever however you can describe those kinds of things can't really be described in words necessarily but. Um, yeah, it was a, it was quite a process. Kindry, we thank you so much for allowing us into your home and into your studio and into this fabulous journey that you were on. You're very welcome.